Hi, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to McDougal's Medicine with Dr. John and Mary McDougal. I'm their daughter and your host, Heather McDougal. And tonight we're going to get to general questions. But first, I want to hear from Dr. John McDougal. And you too, Mom. Hi. Great to see Hi. you both. Hi. How are you? And we're good. She's doing good, Heather. She's making some really, really good dishes. In fact, you should probably, if we have some, well, if I don't hog the time, we should have you talk a little bit about some of the great food you've been fixing. Oh, well. All right. Uh, yeah, let me let me just move along here. Yeah. All right. Well, you were saying you had so much to share. You were worried you weren't be, going to be able to get through it all. So yeah, yeah. Well, uh, let's let's give it a try. I've got a lot a lot of material. He's been working on it all afternoon. So. Ooh. Yeah, I have. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, hopefully you can see this chart. Yes. Heather? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. All right. All right. We have a copy of this chart for you, which you can download from, uh, I think, the chat. And what this represents is a summary of the McDougal diet versus the semi-glutides. You know, Ozempi, Quigovi, what are the rest of them, Mary? You know what they are. What? Monjaro yeah. and... Um, we, uh, uh, Waybound. Or web, webbound. Webbound. Yeah. I tell, they've got about six of them on the shelf ready to put out. This, this is the biggest thing in medicine. Uh, they they predicted this is going to change how medicine is practiced. It's going to change the food industry. It's going to change the medical business. They expect that the sale of these drugs will be the most profitable thing that medicine has ever done. Yeah. I mean, you should just read the reviews of what, what they plan on doing. This is, of course, uh, something put out by Nova Disc and Eli Lilly, and they pay for all of the research. As far as I know, nobody does any other research besides these two drug companies, and they're pushing hard. You know, they have the attitude, look, I told you 91% of people are too fat for their health. I told you that last time. You know, they they uh, they would like to catch everybody. You know, they, they figure the whole population, well, of course, they're not going to get the Chinese and the Japanese, except for the rich ones. Uh, you know, they're trying to capture the entire world. And believe me, this is a huge deal. So I think you ought to have an option, an alternative. And I put this chart together to summarize for you what you get on the McDougal diet as opposed to the semi-glutides. You do take your pick. And, and what you can print this out, give it to friends, go over it with them. You know, I'll show it again so that, uh, you know, if I don't get it, you know, across this time, we'll do it again and again. I put a lot of work in this. Okay, uh, the issue, weight loss in a year, all right? Conservatively, our participants based on Two studies, one-year studies, OHSU and the one done in New Zealand. Our weight loss is on average 22 pounds. But we started at 180 pounds, our average weight in our participants that went through the McDougal program. The semi-glutides, they started a weight of 233 pounds. So, you know, uh, a good 70 pounds heavier. If you're heavier, you're going to lose more. And their average weight loss at one year is 25 pounds. All right, that's the weight loss for a year. Uh, then you have a problem with plateaus. What happens is the body says, look, I'm going to die. Let's get cool here. I mean, you haven't been eating and uh, you need some energy and things are not going well. So the appetite finally becomes strong enough. So you stop losing weight. It's called a plateau. And it occurs at 68 weeks. You lose no more weight. I mean, that's just average. You lose no more weight. You hit a plateau. So you stay on the drug. You got to stay on the drug. Otherwise, what happens is you regain the weight. All right, there is no plateau on the McDougal diet. Absolutely, you're going to hit trim body weight. I assure you, you will hit trim body weight. Uh, okay, the, the nice thing about, uh, about our solution to the problem is you, you bring pleasure into your life. The food's delicious. Now, these semi-glutides, uh, they, 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 it talks about how people lose their food noise. Yeah, you know, they lose their appetite. They're sick. Nothing tastes good. And uh, that's that's how they lose weight. We lose you lose weight by eating the right things, not by not by manipulating your hunger drive and whether or not you have a, a gastric emptying or slowed gastric digestion, which by the way gives you terrible bad breath. Okay, so expected side effects on the McDougal diet. I'll admit to a little extra, a little extra flatus. That's it. No other side effects. But you try the semi-glutides, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and halitosis are expected. Yeah, that's that's what they do. That's why why you call it lose weight. You're sick. So the desired effects is to feel well. That's what you're trying to do on the McDougal diet. It gives sort of constipation, indigestion, 
uh, arthritis problems. I mean, serious arthritis problems, uh, angina, et cetera. And that's the desired effects of changing your diet, food. Uh, the desired effects for the semi-glutides is to make you feel unwell. Yeah, you have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. You know, somewhere at least half the people who go on the program have significant GI distress, so it interferes with their eating. Pregnancy. Uh, it's this, and you see my uh, January 2011 newsletter, January 2011 newsletter on pregnancy, and you'll see how I made the argument that the best diet for a pregnant woman and a great outcome is the diet that 99.999% of people followed for, you know, a million years. And they had, you know, 100 million babies. That's what, I mean, those are statistics I got. So... Anyway, this is the right diet that would produce more, more, more offspring on a starch-based diet, the McDougal diet, than you know, any other any other type of eating pattern. And of course, when you eat the Western diet, we're not talking about the semaglutides. You eat the Western diet, what happens is uh, you're sick. You're eating foods that cause birth defects and, and uh, excess weight gain, so you need to have a cesarean section. I mean, it's really a disaster. Read, read, read the January 2011 newsletter if you're interested in pregnancy. Cost. Cost. Well, let's compare what we do. You reduce the food expenses by 20 to 80 percent. 80 percent if you're a frequent dining out person. Uh, where, you know, see, so you save a little money because you're not eating as much on the uh, semi glutides, but the real hit comes from the fact that you have to spend somewhere between $1,000 and $1,400 a month. By the way, when you hit a plateau at around uh, 68 weeks, uh, you've spent $17,000 to accomplish a 38 pound weight loss. That's it, folks. And all you right. have to keep spending that money or you're gonna lose, you're gaining all that. Everybody knows if you don't keep taking the shots, even though you're not losing any more weight, you're still gonna pay the money. You still gotta stay on it. Otherwise, if you quit, you're gonna regain the lost weight. Uh, with our program, most people are really happy. And, and I'm gonna tell you why. And what we find is 85% of people finish the end of the year following the program that we teach. Uh, adherence, this is an important thing. I, I just found a research paper which summarizes the adherence uh, that people on semi-glutides are able to accomplish. Half of them go off the diet. But we, and, and our research published 85% of people are adhere to the diet for a year. You get those numbers, 85% compared to 50%. You spend all that money. You well, have, and besides the money, don't they tell you you have to eat special foods or you well, have the, to reduce your yeah, calories? Yeah, they cut the size. calorie intake by 500 calories. And uh, you also are supposed to get exercise. Okay. And the weight loss in the in the control group, which is what you're talking about, yeah. the people that compare with the intervention, intervention they lose about mm, maybe 10 pounds. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, they do lose some weight based on I, I, that. That's a close figure. All right. So, um, Medical oversight, not on our program. In fact, we get most people off medication. Our results published, our results published are that that uh, nearly 90% of people are able to reduce or stop their medications, particularly blood pressure and diabetic medications. You go on the semi-glutides, you have to make regular appointments to get your refills, to make sure you're not getting too sick or the process of dying. You have to, you have to make regular appointments to your doctor. Of course, your doctor benefits from this too because they get to charge you every month. When you refill your prescriptions, uh, life threatening adverse effects, none with our program. Not a lot. Many, many. And you look at the list, you know, pancreatitis, thyroid cancer, et cetera. I mean, the list is very, very long. Of real serious side effects. Uh, our approach uh, reduces comorbid conditions like arthritis, heart disease, diabetes, constipation, et cetera. Why? Because we correct the problem. It's the food, it's the food. And uh, what they, they, they do on these semi-glutides is they can continue the poisonous food. They just eat less of it because they're so sick. Planet-friendly? Mm, we are. We are. In fact, you know, you've heard me talk many times about how, how it's important that we change the diet of the world to save the planet. Which brings me to a question for you. Have, have you watched the Mirror website that I asked you to do on several occasions? M E E R dot org. You know, right now, you know, Heather's suffering from terrible weather. They call it a river going into Southern California. I'm sure you've had your experiences with 
with climate change, haven't you? Well, you know, changing the diet cuts the the uh, the greenhouse gases tremendously. I mean, half of the greenhouse gases are a result of the agricultural industry. And if you change your diet, you get an 80% reduction of carbon dioxide production overnight. And then there's the animals' lives. Uh, it took me a while to come to that kind of empathy, sympathy, sympathy. sympathy. Uh, I, you know, I really just, just wanted to take care of my patients. I was a doctor. I didn't really care about the planet. I didn't really care about animals when I first started out. But I have matured, and I realized that these are really important issues. So you have that chart. I'll go over the same chart again, study it, read it, and uh, share it with friends and relatives. In fact, I encourage you to share it with everybody you know. This is a direct comparison of what you get when you follow a starch-based diet, the McDougal program, versus taking Gila monster reptile poison. Did I say that right? Probably too enthused, right? <laughs> I, I get complaints about getting too enthused. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, okay. I, I, I'm sorry, actually, folks, I can't, can't help it. Can't help it. So if you want to get poisoned by a, a reptile that lives in the southwest United States or a derivative of this reptile's poisonous venom, you go that route. <laughs> I wonder if there's a, animal abuse for that poor Gila monster. Well, they don't use them anymore. No, they don't use them anymore. They just, they just suck the poison out of his lower jaw and they let him go. I think so. Well, no, they have the, they, must, they must make it in a lab now. Yeah, they do. And what they've done, see the Gila monster poison, what's that Gila monster bite you? Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, fatigue. I mean, it really gets sick. But it'll last for two minutes. You can't, can't build a weight off struggle. It'll last for only two or two minutes. So what they've done is they've taken this, this molecule of poison. It's, it's poison. And they've taken it to the laboratory and they've uh, stretched out the poisonous effect so that a shot lasts all day or all week. Now they've got drugs that they think everybody should take. They work hard at telling you this is not due to the food. This is a society problem. This is a problem with you. There's something wrong with you. That's what they do because, because of business. Oh, cool. All right. So I, I finished that chart for you, and I encourage you, as I say, to put a thousand copies. I'd like it to become viral. Yeah. Well, yeah. Why not? <laughs> Okay. Um, anyway, let's get on to the presentation today. All right, there we go. Okay, uh, let's talk about 2 million years of eating carbohydrates because what happens, I wrote a book called uh, The Healthiest Diet on the Planet. In that book, there's a review of different patterns of eating throughout history. You might want to get that book. You might want to uh, review it. Also, The Starch Solution has a bit of a review, but that was written in 2011. I got a whole section on my computer where I have updated research, where archaeologists find other populations which tell us that the human being is a starch eater. We've lived on various starches throughout human history. All right. Uh, this is the article that stimulated me to add this presentation to this evening. And it was an article that was just published in PLOS, Public Library of Science One. And it's about a population population of people in South America that lived on starch plants, very few animals. And, uh, you know, that was like what we decided was, was nine 9,000 to 6,000 years ago. Yeah. yeah, it was a long time ago. Uh, they, they put in a calculation, 9.0 and 6.5 ka, cal dot k, this 1,000 years. Okay. So anyway, uh, there's the most recent example that, I, that I've, I've been confronted with of Stuff I've known for a long time. I want to share this with you. Uh, you folks got really excited about hunter-gatherers with the paleo diet. That was a very popular book. Some of you still follow it, the idea that we're hunter-gatherers. And that means, well, in the hunter-gatherer approach, Warren Cordain tells us we shouldn't eat dairy, shouldn't eat refined food, shouldn't eat sugar, uh, but you can eat loads of meat. In fact, you can make, you know, a good share of your diet meat to the point where you suffer from Protein poisoning. You can get protein poisoning on the paleo diet, so be careful. Uh, anyway, it went through a phase of popularity. Why in the world would, would something like that uh, be popular, especially when I just showed you a study where they looked at the isotopes of the bones and hair of people you know, six to 9,000 years ago, and they found there were star cheaters. What, what, this is modern archaeology. That's what it is. Uh, prior to, say, 40 years ago, what they found at in the villages next to the fire pit 
is they found bones. And these bones had uh, had knife cuts in them. And they, and they had knives. <laughs> yeah, they had stone knives. And that's all that the archaeologists could find back then because orange peels rot, corn cobs rot. You know, they're not going to last six to 9,000 years. So that's how people came to the conclusion that we were hunter-gatherers with an emphasis on honey. No reasonable archaeologist talks that way anymore. It's just complete nonsense. All right, let's take a look at some of the populations of people. And this is just a touch, folks. I, I put the references for you so you can read. You, you can read further on these populations of people who are starch eaters. You know, uh, in a cave in South Africa, they were found to uh, live off a starch called the yellow star flower. Uh, you know, mostly, and, and roots, they ate a lot of roots, but that's what they found. When, and, and of course, the way they found this, as opposed to just finding bones and, and, and stone knives next to the fire pit, is they started looking at the, uh, the food caught between people's teeth and the calculus that was created as a result of eating a plant-based diet, or they looked at their bone structure and they found out, they found out, uh, you know, what, what the mineral content was of their bone or hair. So modern, modern archaeology has consistently found what I'm going to show you right now. Uh, let's see, South Africa. This is Mozambique. All right, Mozambique, 105,000 years ago, we find examples of starch granules. Yeah, starch. But these are the starch granules on your left. Uh, the, the Neanderthals, you know, you always think about the Neanderthals, the ultimate in the hunter. Eh, not true, not true. Uh, most of the Neanderthals lived on starch-based diets. And, uh, you know, that's, that's really how people developed uh, into modern Homo sapiens with big brains, is they had to have the starch. You know, even though the brain is like 80% fat, it's starch. In fact, Heather has a great article she'd be glad to share with you on the evolution of of, uh, of the brain and carbohydrates. We passed out a couple couple weeks ago, so hey, stay tuned. Anyway, uh, in this case, they looked at the plaque around the teeth and they found evidence of starch granules. Uh, here's another one, Neanderthals in uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, they looked at their feces. Yeah. And uh, they found that Neanderthals- the feces lasted that long? Uh, yeah, they're called petroglyphs. Oh, okay. they, they become rock hard. Okay. And they last. Yeah. Good question, Mary. So anyway, the title of this article is Uber Carnivores. You know, I don't know. Humans are at the top of the food chain. So we ate mostly meat. That's what people believe. But when you look at the poop of the Neanderthal, what you find is they were starch eaters. Uh, here's a population of people. This is in Turkey, I believe. Uh, 12,000 years ago, they did an excavation of this population of people, and they found a whole bunch of uh, grain storage, vats, and they found vats full of porridge and stew made of grains. Yeah. Uh, here's one for you. This, this, I love this one, because most of the stuff that I talked to you about uh, looks at uh, you know, uh, kind of fossilized material between the teeth and so on. But this is a peat bog in, uh, south of Santiago, Chile. And the peat bog preserved organic material. Yeah. You know, whereas uh, in other circumstances, when you have the oxygen around the organic material, <clears throat> it, um, it, it it disappears. Anyway, in this population where they found or, organic material, I mean, 45 species of plants, including potatoes, bamboos, mushrooms, et cetera. They found 22 species of medicinal plants, plant eaters. 14,000 years ago, folks. All right. We took a trip to Peru. You'll never forget that. Yeah. We took a we took a group uh, to Peru and down the Amazon. We went there a couple of times. Well, Lake Titicaca is one of the places we went to, and that's the picture of it right here. And people in that part of the world, the Andes, they're known as starch eaters. They live primarily on potatoes. Everybody was trim, except for the waiters and the cooks when we went into restaurants. They were overweight. Otherwise, the whole population that we saw, pretty much, no, a few exceptions, were trim and healthy until we got to Lake Titicaca. And what we found is the women were markedly overweight. So that that was a, uh, a contradiction that troubled me greatly until I asked <clears throat> some of the families uh, what their food was. And, hey, they live on a lake. What do you think they ate? 
and this is really what it looks like. It's an island in the middle yeah. of a lake. There's yeah. no way to get to shore. There, yeah, there, it's built on reeds. Yeah, there's Ann Wheat right there. Well, I know. I some, see. Many it. people know Ann Wheat. Anyway, wherever we went, we saw potato eaters, and we just had a great old time. <laughs> All right. But you didn't tell them what you asked the people. Oh, I asked them why why your wife <laughs> I shouldn't say what I people know me though. Yeah, people don't I, know. I asked particularly the men who I got him kind of got on the side and said, Hey, how come your women are so fat? And they said, Well, we we live on an island, we fish. And that's, they fry it. And they fry it, yeah. That's why. So again, didn't break the rules, didn't break no the... exercise. There's no place to walk. To. Yeah, really, just on this mat. All right. Let's see, what do we got here? Oh, here we go. This is uh, West Peru, all right? And oh, what you see here on the left-hand side, kind of the brownish picture, is you see a tooth, a tooth. <laughs> see that right there, the tooth? Oh, yeah, right there. Yeah, there's some, a bunch of tooth oh, people. Yeah. And, and what they found between the teeth are what we call starch granules. You can identify what starch they come from. Squash and beans and peanuts and grains, that's the starch granules. That's West, Western Peru, was that? that was a while back. Uh, oh, the, um, the Iceman, okay, this guy that was buried in the Alps in Italy, and they uh, found him, and he was pretty good shape as far as pre pre being preserved, and what they found based on his hair analysis is that he was primarily a vegetarian. Yeah, that was a long time ago, too, a few thousand years. Okay, uh, I like this one, the Tolid Man, which is in, well, where is that? They, it's, it's in Denmark. Okay, this is another peat bog. <clears throat> they found uh, they found this man. He's a famous man. I mean, he's in a museum, the Tolan man, and uh, he died uh, about four hundred years before Christ BC. He was killed. He was hung. That's what they said. And they uh, examined uh, the meal that was in the stomach. It was eighty five percent barley. A little fish, a little flaxseed. Hey, I'm not trying to tell you that these people were vegan. They certainly weren't. But the bulk of their calories came from starch. Uh, oh, here we go. Well, you know, we're from Hawaii. And I looked into the research on people who uh, originally populated Hawaii, the Polynesians, and their staple food is taro, breadfruit, sweet potatoes, bananas, taro tops, and vegetables. <clears throat> they raised pigs for religious sacrifice. They didn't have pigs until the missionaries came over. Yeah. Anyway, another example of starch eaters. Uh, Native Americans, okay? A couple of interesting research papers that you're going to read, I know you are, or I encourage you to do. Uh, it's about what they found at in the Four Corners. Okay, Four Corners is a place where four of our states of the United States come together, Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico. They found what they call the Four Corners potatoes, 10,000, 11,000 years. And I, I love this coin. This is a a, a coin that I often pass out, and it's about the three sisters. Okay, the three sisters, and it's in honor of Sequoia. Oh, 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 I don't, I don't, don't, put I don't remember. All right, said you guys. Anyway, that's her right there. And this coin came out, and you see she's picking the, the crop of three sisters: corn, squash, and beans. That's their diet. Now uh, you've probably heard of the blue zones and. Uh, Dan Butner, he wrote this book, and he's a pretty good friend of mine. And you know, we had a nice conversation, and we talked about populations of people where there's a, a large number of people who live to be over a hundred years old. And these are the countries that uh, they call the blue zones, and they're listed there for you: Loma Linda, California, Bacaria, Greece, uh, Nicoya, Costa Rica, Sardinia, Italy, and Okinawa, Japan. Uh, high life, large, large population of of uh, people that live over 100, well, you know, uh, what Dan says is they eat a whole food plant-based diet, 95% plants, all right? And during a breakfast we have, I, I asked him, I said, Dan, can you make a more common conclusion about these populations of people? And he said, what do you mean? I said, they're all starch eaters. Yeah, he thought that was pretty, pretty interesting. They're all starch eaters. Uh, as far as longevity goes, if you compare Japan with Okinawa, in Okinawa, they eat a large amount of rice compared to Japan. Uh, and the people in Okinawa have a, the 83% of their calories are, are, uh, are rice, are the Okinawans, 83% of the calories. Whereas in mainland Japan, it's much less. Well, you know, 
Okinawans uh, have four to five times the, the risk of heart disease, for example. Anyway, another great population of people who want to study, starch eaters, rice eaters. Now let's see, Roman soldiers. Roman soldiers ask their, uh, their captains, you know, their leaders, to not feed meat before they went to battle because they knew if they ate meat, they wouldn't perform as well. They're like, more likely to get killed. And then we have Alexander the Great and Genghis Khan, two conquerors that conquered the known world. And they did it on corn, not maize, okay? Corn refers to grains, rice, wheat, not to the, the kind of corn that we usually uh, think about in terms of corn from <clears throat> Central America, that's maize. All right, rice, you know that, you know that for 10,000 years, rice has been the diet of Asians. Before 1980, 90%, I got the data. Before 1980, 90% of the diet of, of Asians came from rice, and it was white rice. And before 1980, they had no obesity, no, almost no type 2 diabetes. But now, now we have a population in China. Which is this, uh, anyway, we have a population in China where... Uh, article came out in the year 2013 in the Journal of the American Medical Association that said, well, before 1980, 90% of the diet was white rice, and there was virtually no diabetes or obesity. But since 1980, and this was reported in 2013, 12% of the Chinese population has developed diabetes, and half are pre-diabetic. Since 1980, oh, 43 years. All right. Uh, people of the corn... The Central America and Mexico, you know this. And of course, we have the Egyptians who lived primarily on rice and barley. You know, you can't argue with history. Papua New Guinea lived on sweet potato roots and leaves. Strong, healthy people with no heart diseases, no, none of our common cancers. And 90% uh, of their dietary intake is sweet potatoes. Cholesterol is 153. Anyway, if you read the articles I've cited here, uh, you'll get a great education. I don't have time to tell you about each and every slide in detail. Uh, uh, his name is uh, Nathaniel Dominey. He talked at one of our advanced study weekends. And he published a paper that any of you who are interested in science should read. It's about the change in the, uh, the, the genes of homo sapiens. Uh, excuse me, of the genes of primates. What they found is that when, when lesser, lesser primates, when chimpanzees and apes and so on, they're primarily stuck at the equator because they have to have a plentiful supply of fruits and perishable vegetables. They can't leave the equator. That's where they grow all the time, fruit, enough fruits and vegetables to keep them alive. Well, in the evolution of a primate, uh, what we find is we have incorporated in the Homo sapien genome special enzymes that digest starch. And that's one of the big difference between Homo sapiens, in other words, us people, and the, uh, the lesser primates, is lesser primates only have two copies of the amylase digesting gene. We have between six and 16. Why? And then we, could, then we could leave the equator, we could go north and south, because when winter came, fall and late, early spring came, and, and all the fruits and vegetables were gone, What'd they do? Well, they dug under the ground and they pulled up potatoes and roots and all kinds of things. So in other words, the migration of the Homo sapien north and south to populate the entire planet was due to the fact that we have special enzymes of special ability to digest starch. All right. So, um, uh, okay, so uh, here we go. This is the story I was trying to tell you, is that uh, as, as, the, as the primate left the equator, lesser primates, to become what we call greater primates or human beings, uh, they developed a large number of these starch di digesting genes. Uh, uh, hopefully this will play for you. Uh, Daniel Dominey was a guest at our advanced study weekends on a couple of occasions, and we had a chance to talk a little bit. And so what, what do we tell our, uh, our friends and relatives who tell us that we're primarily eat meat eaters because we're hunter gatherers, <laughs> with an emphasis on hunter because that's you know the man thing to do, and gathering is the woman thing to do. That's a, that's a myth. Hunters and gatherers, the majority of their calories come from plant foods. Yeah. So, 
That's, that's a myth. So, uh, hunters and gatherers, the majority of all the calories that any hunting and gathering population gets comes from its plant foods. So that's, that's what's most reliable. Uh, meat is just too unpredictable. You can't, you can't rely on it. So kind of, kind of as, a, as, a, as a summary statement, uh, as an expert anthropologist, uh, you know, you've, you've spent your whole life studying the human diet and its relationship to teeth and bones and chemicals and genes and so on. Your conclusion is the human being is a... Starchivore. <laughs> can, can I, can I uh, use that in my new book? Okay, sure. sure. Yeah, and that quote. Thank you very much. Sure thing. Excellent. Thank you. All right, so uh, the reason Hunter gets such an emphasis is because of sexism. It's male dominance, which is, I think we have it going on today. You know, uh, what, what, what do you have? You have men who go out on the big hunt, maybe it takes a couple of weeks, maybe they shoot an animal, maybe they get it back before it rots, maybe. But who collects the food? Their grandparents, children, women. You know, they're the ones that got the bulk of the food by gathering. So, you know, it's much sexier. And planting the garden. Yeah. No. Much sexier to go out and kill something. I suppose. Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> all right. So, all large successful populations throughout all of verifiable human history have obtained the bulk of their calories from starch. There have been some exceptions, like the Inuit Eskimo, and there, there's a tribe I can think of in South America, and the Maasai that live in Africa. But, you know, we're talking about mm, quite a few people. Uh, in fact, uh, I've been challenged by the fact that it means a uh, hundred million people. Yeah, that walk lot. this earth. That's, That's a lot of people. That's a lot of starch eaters. Anyway, you can read corn, corn in Central and South America, uh, sweet potatoes in the Caribbean, barley in the Middle East, oats, wheat in the, the Far East. Where we see rice eaters. You, you guys, you, you got to kind of get it. <laughs> yeah, you know. What I'm trying to say is you couldn't have made a dime off of off of semi-glutides. <laughs> you know, That's true. It, 50 years ago, years, no, no, you, don't you dare try, if you are a member of Eli, uh, Lily, or Nova Disc, don't, don't, you, don't you dare try and expand your market, at least not for a while, to, to China or Japan or Thailand, because you'll go broke. you got to have a bunch of sick people. And we have them right here in the United States and in Europe and in Australia and New Zealand. So that I gave you data last Sunday night that showed you that 91% of people were too fat for their health. I hear a lot of folks saying 80% are, are overweight, 40% are obese, but this is an interesting paper, 91%. That's 69% of the children. Hey, that's a heck of a business, but what we're going to try and do is put them out of business. I mean, think about it for just a minute. I, if you were a, um, a just a uh, you're, you're a consumer, what would you rather do? Would you rather spend you know a thousand bucks a month to make yourself sick, develop nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or would you rather eat potatoes, rice, and corn? I think you should be at least offered the option, and then you know as many people will find they just don't have quote the willpower or the, the hunger noise is too great, you know, you, you can add, I suppose, these extra crutches, the uh, semi-glutides, the shots, the pills. You can do that, but you're, you're going to be compromising your health if you do it. All right, I'm going to end here in just a second, but there are a couple of things, just to be well-rounded, a couple of things that I noticed in the news this week that I wanted to share with you. Uh, one is that even 15 minutes of activity reduces the risk compared to City Down. It was published in JAMA, all right? 13 year surveillance, about half a million people. And what they find is that uh, if you just sit around, you got a 60% higher risk of any disease and a 43% higher risk, 43 higher risk of- uh, 34. 34, thank you, Mary. Um, <laughs> more, uh, I, at, at this point, they don't really care. But they want, see, if they say, well, he made a mistake, he's inaccurate, they can always look at the references and say, well, you know, it's legitimate, he's 76 years old. All right, I found another one that I think you might find interesting. New York Times, uh, January 23rd, in the New York Times, they had an article titled The Link Between Birth Control Pills and Sex Drive. 
Now, you know, as a general doctor, I, I've taken care of 12,000 people. And a lot of a lot of men and women ask me about uh, what I what I prefer in terms of birth control. Well, you know, part of the pitch I give is look, the, the safest thing to do is the rhythm cycle. Practice effectively. Of course, the joke goes, people who practice the rhythm cycle are called parents. <laughs> uh barrier methods, that's a good way with condoms and and the cervical condoms yeah and uh you know i think that's that's probably iud maybe an iud you want to think about you still still have your sex drive with an iud and then part of the pitch that i would give to the woman or hopefully the man and the woman is look if you take this birth control pills you won't feel the mid cycle surge that's associated with you getting pregnant mm -hmm. and so the heat the passion the enjoyment of having a sexual relationship is out the window or not totally out the window, but you get the point. It's not as good as it could be because you've got to have these urges, these surges. And if you take birth control pills or any hormones, you're just kind of numb. That's the good way to scratch. You just lay there numb. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's a lot more fun in life if you don't suppress hormones with birth control pills. Of course, that could be an, another child too. <laughs> Anyway, it's it's a mixed discussion, and I just wanted to share that with you because it brought back memories of how I spent as a general doctor trying to advise advise people in all stages of life. And if you're on birth control pills and it just ain't what it used to be, all right, Heather, I'm done. <laughs> all right, that okay. was a little bit shorter uh, than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> um, I I could have gone on forever, and I really, really I I only gave you just a, a tiny smattering. Of the lecture, I'm going to give this lecture. Go through all those papers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, got, I went through. This is there. You see, sex drive in the New York Times. I'll check. Oh. All right. All right. You answer questions. I, I'm going to be you. giving a talk tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock Pacific time on Chef AJ's show, and it'll be the same talk. Give it to you folks first because yeah. you're so important to Mary and I. But uh, tomorrow morning, if you want to pick up the talk again, it'll be Chef AJ, 10 a.m. Pacific time, and you'll have to find out where her channel is. Well, I'll be talking then, and Mary will probably, ooh, really join me at one point. Probably not. Come on. <laughs> you have enough to talk about without uh, me saying okay. that. You have people like, one, they need to hear from you, Mary. They need to hear about how you make this really, really tasty. All right, I'm going to put you on the spot. You served over the last week or two a couple of dishes that Jason, our grandson, myself, and you just... I haven't had, had, had a chance to try the last one yet because I haven't made it. The black, the black, bean well, soup. black bean soup. We had it once last week and she made it again tonight. You're going to make it a little thicker. I did, though. All right. I did that already. And I love raw onions, but they don't love me. How about I made some for you? All right. And a little bit of mustard on top and some maybe some bread or a baked potato along with it. Whoa. And then you made an Indian dish this week from India, the continent of India. Yeah. Or not. Yeah, but I I haven't written it up yet because uh -huh. it, it was it was a very time consuming dish. Yeah. But it was basically potatoes and cauliflower. Oh, so with good. a lot of Indian so spice. Good. And then you made that rice uh, tofu Japanese rice. dish last night. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't um, if you have not begun to appreciate what you're being offered, it's time to stop. And make yourself a few of these meals that we make. Mary has 4,000 published recipes. All you need to do is find a few favorites. We, we eat the same thing for breakfast every day. We have oatmeal and fruit. We eat the same things for lunch and dinner pretty much every day. And there's only one place in town that we eat out because it's got clean food. Otherwise, you have got to do it. And then uh, there's about four, four, five, six things that Mary rotates. And we have leftovers for dinner the next night or, or, or lunch the next day. This is simple. The food is the food is really easy to clean up afterwards. There's no grease, you know. This you just put it in the a little wash with water, and that's it. You're done. You don't need heavy detergents, and uh, you'll get to the point where you find oil disgusting. Really, it's it's repulsive. You know that already. What do they call a restaurant with a bad reputation? A greasy spoon. And 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 why why do you wash your face and hands and the kitchen counters when you get oil on them or, or fat on them? It's disgusting. You naturally are disgusted by oil. 
So why do they put oil in the food? Why, why do they do that? Well, oil uh, causes the things that you really like to stick to the foods that you really ought to be eating. Uh, for example, uh, uh, salt sticks to the potato chips and french fries. You know, they started out as potatoes. Salt sticks to the potato chips and french fries because of the oil. Yeah, sugar. That's not the only reason, because I, every recipe that I see that I attempt to adapt, yeah. I mean, like the the bean soup recipe that I'm making tonight, yeah. it tells you just, you know, start by putting the olive oil in the pan yeah. and then adding the onions and sauteing them. So what and do you do? I, I just use water. And it works just fine. But it's not, it's, it's also used to soften vegetables and, and things like that. So it's not only to make salt and sugar. It, it, oh, oh, I see it, what you mean. They're used to, yeah, there's all, yeah. Uh, they're, they're, they're used to cooking in it. Well, I'm just thinking of uh, uh, you know, my past life. I know. You know, you go to McDonald's and guess what? French fries are really popular. That's because they're drowning in salt and they got to get the salt to stick to the potatoes. Grease. Uh, well, anyway, you think we should stop? I think you ought to answer a few questions. You only have 20 minutes left. Well, we're going to be here next Sunday night, 5 o'clock <laughs> Pacific time. And by the way, our, our um, attendance uh, over the last year or two has more than quadrupled. So you're out there telling people that there's a better message, or at least one they ought to be listening to, 5 o'clock Pacific time every Sunday evening. Just give the McDougals a chance. You can always look. There's thousands of doctors out there that will give you shots of semi-glutides, put you on blood pressure pills, diabetic pills, or send you off to heart surgery and amputations of your parts. It's called <laughs> cancer <laughs> treatment. Talk to us first. You know, it's it's cheap, relatively cheap compared to what you're going to pay for, like heart surgery. $300,000. But no. stop. No. All right. Heather, Questions. Please. Okay, but before we get to questions, I did want to mention that we are not going to be here next not Sunday night. Oh, thank you, Heather. <laughs> well, I see this is kind of emphasized that we're not going to be there because I told them we were going to be there. Now they know <laughs> we're not going to be here next Sunday night. But will they be here the following Sunday? Almost yeah. always we try and make it. Most Sundays. Yeah. Are, are, so we're just going to leave it blank or are we going to do a special? Well, it depends now, on if you want to get together and... <laughs> Skip one, skip one, one week. I, I suppose you're going to yeah, have some They're going to be busy with the Super Bowl and all that. So yeah, we'll right. give them the there same. There you go. Not next week. We'll be there. Thanks, Heather. Okay. Okay. And, ready and for people, some questions? People know about the chart, right? They can get the chart off the chat. I want <laughs> yes, them to have that sure. chart. Yes. We'll get them the chart. Okay. Ready? This is hmm. from Tom. He wrote in. He has been following the McDougal program since 2018. Uh, he's had a heart attack and has one stint. His bilirubin is a bit high and he's worried. Should he be? Well, it depends. Uh, the, most of the time, the bilirubin is high because of a condition called Gilbert's. G-I-L-B-E-R-T-S, I think. Gilbert's, that'll get, you'll, you'll find it. Gilbert's syndrome. And what happens when you, uh, when you uh, fast, which you do between meals, is the bilirubin goes up. If you eat a high carbohydrate diet, the bilirubin goes down. The way you decide whether this is this innocuous condition of Gilbert syndrome, it's no disease at all. It's just a variation that takes place in metabolism in a few genetically susceptible people. You can add uh, more starch to your diet and it usually goes away, but you also want to make sure it's not due to something else. You can have an elevated bil bilirubin because of, uh, of hemolysis of your blood cells. In other words, in, inside your blood vessels, the, the red blood cells break down and release uh, and release uh, uh, they release hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is metabolized into bilirubin. You know that. Do you know that? No, they know. Okay, well, I, they kind of know it now. Oh, no, they know now. They know it. <laughs> All right. They know so you you are, you want to make sure you check it out. And the way you do it is a simple, cheap blood test. You want to check your liver function tests. So you do an SGOT, SGPT. GGT, yeah, you know, your doctor knows what to order. And if every, all those are normal and your belly room is just slightly high, don't worry about it. You got to get a better syndrome. If the other liver tests are abnormal and you're sick in some other way, you need to see a doctor. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. Next question. This is from Jill. She's wanting you to talk about osteoporosis and what sort of treatment you would recommend. Well, it's a disease. You're not supposed to. Let me be a little religious because it's Sunday. God did not design us to live for 85 years with a set of bones that only lasted 60. We must be doing something wrong, I think. All right. So what are we doing wrong? Well, the, you know, you've heard about exercise. That's important for bone strength. You've heard about sunshine and vitamin D. That's, a, that's important. But the main thing is the food. It's the high protein nature of the Western diet. Animal protein in particular. What happens is protein breaks down into amino acids. There are 20 amino acids that make up all the proteins in nature. So you digest it in your stomach and your small intestine, and you break down these proteins into amino acids. They change from neutral as protein to acidic as amino acids through digestion. So now you got a bunch of acid you're dumping in your system. Animal foods are particularly high in a certain kind of amino acid. These are sulfur-containing amino acids. Methionine and cysteine are the two amino acids. They break down into sulfuric acid. It's one of the strongest acids that we know of. So you dump all this acid in the system and the body must maintain a pH of 7.4. You die if that doesn't happen. So the body fights to maintain this slightly alkaline condition of 7.4. And the primary buffering system of the body as every medical student learns in their first physiology class is the bones. So the bones dissolve. Now, not just lose the calcium, but actually the bone material dissolves. And you can find the bone material in the urine. So your first step, we want to take care of sunshine, a little bit of exercise, not too much, not dangerous. You want to fix the food. You want to eat an alkaline diet. The McDougal diet is an alkaline diet. So that's what you do. Is it reversible? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, should you take a treatment for it? Well, sometimes. I, I, as I told you, I keep trying to tell you I'm a real doctor. And uh, I run into situations where I'm really concerned, you know, just changing the diet, walking around in a little sunshine may not be enough for that particular patient. And I'll need to, to uh, recommend something extra. I don't recommend the bisphosphonates. No. Or most of the other drugs uh, that are so popular, of course, very expensive too. But what I recommend is, uh, is uh, antacids. Yeah. I mean, the problem is acid. So why not take antacids? Well, you, if you take antacids, like, for example, Tums, doesn't have to be Tums. Tums is calcium carbonate. Could be, uh, it could be milk and magnesia or sodium carbonate or, you know, any, any kind of antacid would work because it's not the calcium. It's the antacid part. So you take antacids, say, a couple of Tums a day. You shouldn't do this. You should not do this unless you have very, very, or you suspect you have very serious bone disease because that calcium causes constipation and it could create iron deficiency. Those calcium and dairy foods drag a hold of, grab iron out of your system. All right, so you don't wanna do that only if you have a real high risk, you don't do that. And then the next thing you do is you have your doctor prescribe estrogen. Well, you know, we talked about estrogen a lot over the past few weeks and realize that estrogen promotes uterine cancer, gallbladder disease and breast cancer. It does, no matter how much you've heard, it doesn't. It does all three of these, uh, but it also builds bone. And so if your fear of breaking a bone is greater than your fear of say, uh, problems with your uterus, then you, you'd go that route. Hey, every treatment has effects. They have, every treatment has both adverse effects and positive effects. What your goal is and your doctor's goal should be is to find something that gives you more, more good outcomes than bad outcomes. You know, I mean, your doctor should be able to figure that out if they're <clears throat> carefully considering the, the science. But th that's how I take care of it. A little walk and a little sunshine, really strict diet. You, you, you might even, I, I hate to get into this, but you might even avoid beans, peas, and lentils and grains because they're slightly acidic. Not much, not much. We know that, that these grains and beans can be easily handled by the human body because Asians, for example, they don't get high rates of osteoporosis. What is their diet? Rice, there's a lot of beans. 
So the amount of acid in rice and beans is, is insignificant. But, you know, people who are going to try and badmouth your diet, you know, those people who like to hear good news about their bad habits, they're going to say, well, you probably eat legumes and grains <laughs> and they're acidic. So don't do that. Yeah, acidic compared to what? They have an acid load of one. Cheese has an acid load 10 times greater. Fish, nine times greater. Chicken, eight times greater. Beef, six times greater. Oh, I don't see how one can make any difference at all. It doesn't, does it? <laughs> Asians don't have high rates of osteoporosis, right? head fractures, et cetera, because the body can handle a certain amount of acid, but not, not the loads you dump in for breakfast, lunch, and dinner with bacon and eggs and roast beef sandwiches. And, it ain't going to work. You know, you're stressing your system beyond its ability to defend itself. Heather. <laughs> okay, next question. EFSS26 wrote in and would like to know your recommendations for someone with a lazy colon. Well, that's hard, Heather. That's that's a difficult problem. And I see it. That floppy, floppy colon, lazy colon, megacolon. I mean, when it gets really bad, we call it a megacolon. And it happens in a lot of kids because they have such bad ball habits when they're young. And because of that, they have to grunt and groan and strain and their, their last part of their small, large intestine gets really filled up, compacted, and stretched out. Anyway, it's called a floppy, floppy colon, and it doesn't contract well. There's something called the law of Laplace. Law of La, Laplace. Look it up. The law of Laplace says that when you contract at big diameters, you create few pressures. If you contract at small diameters, you create great pressures. So you see, well, if your colon's all stretched out, it can't contract and poop for you. So how do you fix this? Well, of course, you've got to eat a good diet. No question about it. Drink plenty of water. Maybe do this, some of the things that I talk about in my August 2002 newsletter, September 2002. It's my September 2002 newsletter. It's called In Search of a Perfect Bowel Moment. And there are all kinds of suggestions to help your bowels, uh, including something called uh, Pronulac which is a, a non-absorbable sugar, lact lactulose. Uh, Cryolac is a doctor prescribed medication. And what I do is I start somebody who has a lot of trouble. I start them on this kind of, uh, a, a, kind of a mechanical approach. I mean, you're filling the large intestine with a bunch of bulk, a water and non-absorbable sugar, and it gets stretch out the point where it starts contracting and then it starts contracting more and more and more. And just like a weightlifter that lifts heavy weight, it builds strength in its walls. It may take you a little while, but you'll eventually get there and you slowly reduce the cryolac or the lactulose until you're down to just a basic diet. You know, of course, we're not going to mention don't eat refined foods and eat lots of beans, peas, levels. They're really good for a bowel moment, aren't they? Yeah. And prune juice. Uh, hey, prune juice is a, is a regular part of our program when people first to get started. You know, we have people who come in that haven't had a bowel moment in a week, which is <laughs> distressing to say the least, as I remember. Okay, next question. Can eating nuts cause harm? They can make you fat. You know, I, I, I think nuts and seeds and avocados, unless they're processed, in other words, they've taken the shells off. Of course, you don't eat the shells, but I mean, the, the, shells, the shells, shells make it harder to get at the nuts. That's why you don't, shouldn't eat many. But uh, it'll give you oily skin if you eat enough. I mean, look, there are people who would just eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner, nuts. You know, you're going to run into uh, too many calories, too much fat. Fat you wear under your skin and on your skin. Under your skin is called obesity. Over your skin is called greasy skin and acne. So that's a problem. But as far as them being unhealthy, uh, I, I don't think so. Except for those issues I just talked to you about. I, I don't, if you, and those of you who want to gain some weight, that may be a route for you. Uh, nuts and seeds and avocados. And there are various butters, peanut butter, almond butter, et cetera. They tell me you can gain weight eating a lot of nuts, but I haven't seen it myself yet. But Heather keeps contradicting me and says she does. Yeah, well, well, I, I can vouch for the fact that you try. I try. <laughs> I, I have two large handfuls of almonds every morning with my oatmeal. And there are times when I eat packs of trail mix, healthy trail mix, that have like 240 calories. 
I'll eat three or four or five of those a day. It just doesn't, it doesn't help. Now. I've been working on it. <laughs> Maybe I should exercise less. No, you don't think so. Okay, that's fine. No, that's well, not you're problem. certainly in the minority. Those nuts are dangerous uh, to me. <laughs> well, they certainly, they are delicacies. They're rich food. They put them in a hard shell for a reason. You're not supposed to eat many of them. And they only come in, they only come in bloom during late fall or early fall and late summer. It's not like you got nuts available all year long in well, a natural set. Oh, I've got Whole Foods and yeah. Safeway. Yeah, you do now. Same thing with avocados. We used to have an avocado tree in Hawaii. One week of the year, that little fella came in bloom. Oh, we got a lot of avocados. But then they, they rotted after about a week. So, <laughs> but that, that, that avocado tree only came into bloom once a year in our backyard. Whereas, you know, you go to Whole Foods or Safeway and they're in bloom all year long on, on several shelves in several <laughs> sizes. Yeah. Too much for a good thing. Thank you. Okay, next question. I think we have time to get into this. What would you recommend for someone that has multiple sclerosis? Oh, well, I, I've done research on that. Our, our foundation paid for a study on MS. Uh, I recommend Dr. Roy Swank's work. Uh, Dr. Roy Swank was head of neurology at uh, Oregon Health and Science University, you know, Portland University, okay? For 23 years, he was the head of the department. And he became famous for our, a couple of reasons. He invented the Swank filter, which is a blood filter, made OHSU rich. And he also uh, invented the treatment of a low fat diet to treat MS. And what, I'll just give you the bottom line. My Dr. Swank was my personal friend, okay? He came down, ran two clinics with me. He was a good man. Uh, but what he told me on a couple of occasions, I said, if people follow a healthy diet, I said, what's the chance of getting worse having attacks? He said, it's less than one in 200. And then the other time he told me it was less than one in 500. And then he told me he went to China because the Chinese government invited him over there to see the people with MS in China. Well, he said he went and they presented five cases. Five cases. And he didn't think any of the five had MS. He came home empty handed. And that's the way it is. In parts of the world where people eat a starch based diet, they don't get MS. And I believe if you, if you, if you got a fire, you need to stop throwing gasoline on it. So anyways, I, I, I published some research, didn't have enough money to uh, do the kind of study I'd like to do. But it's a research paper that they could probably read yeah, and really. look up. On. Let's just look up McDougal, McDougal and MS. Well, that's me. <laughs> it's a very, very important paper. The uh, OHSU Neurology Department published it with me. Except I had nothing to do with it, except to teach the people the diet. We taught them the 12-day program. And that's all. That's the only thing that Mary and I and Heather had to do with these participants. Otherwise, it was all done by OHSU. Well, you know, you got to realize there's no bias there. So, anyway, the study's easy to find. But look at Dr. Swank's work. He's got, he's published 176 papers. Roy Swank, big deal. <laughs> and more information can be found on our website at drmcdougall.com. Oh. Yeah, our website is a, is a treasure. We have many doctors who say that when something comes out as far as something they're unfamiliar with, what they do before they even read the research papers is they go see if Dr. John McDougall's written anything about it. And then once they've read what I've written about it, they could better understand what the research papers show. Like, for example, this is a semi-glutide thing we talked about at the beginning. You know, wouldn't you like to be armed with that chart before you started reading the science? Wouldn't you like to know that Eli Lilly and Nova Disc are fund all the research, huh? Wouldn't you like to know that this is a, a big scam? It really is. I mean, there, you've got to read this stuff. It's not like I'm being, uh, you know, getting into conspiracy theories. I and mean, there's this huge business that has declared the fact that they're going to get everybody on these drugs. No, they're talking about them the same way they talked about the people that developed the, the, op the opioids. Well, the opioids, yeah. The, those people that, that said this was not habit forming and, oh, and did, yeah. I, I can't remember the name. Of I know the, what you mean. Or Shackers. The Shack, Shack, Shacker. Shackler family. Yeah. Pfizer. Uh, I think they worked with. Yeah. I went on another drug company. Hey, 
what my last words are to you is get out of the business. Okay. You're not going to win. You know, if you have to go see doctors and hospitals and et cetera, you're, you've got to lose. I mean, these are, are not good days when you have to see the medical business. So get out of the business. And there's only one way to get out of the business safely. And that's to fix the problem. The problem's the food. Thank you. <laughs> oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm trying to tone down my, my spirit a little bit. Oh. I, I, I'm trying to be nice. Impossible. <laughs> Two weeks from now, I'll, I'll have practice of, of uh, not, you know, I don't think they understand my sense of humor. Evan. <laughs> I think that's the problem is they look at me and they go, well, I never met anybody like Dr. John McDougall. I don't know what to think of him. <laughs> it's an acquired taste. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's oh. true. Oh. I like that one, Heather. Well, to know you is, is to my... love you. <laughs> yeah. All I can say is look at my family. <laughs> you know, it was no mistake that we have three highly successful children. You know, Mary and I put a lot of work into our family. I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about for those of you who've done the same. Well, all worth every effort. Anyway, Heather, it's 601. What is the next right program? So our, our next program is March 8th. We're filling up. We're, we just have a few spots left. So um, yeah, sign up now if you're if you're on the fence. I would I would do it now rather than later. Yeah. <laughs> and she actually turns people away. I, do. I, I, I was upset when I found that out, but she does. <laughs> anyway, I can't uh, overwhelm we'll, my team. Okay, that was a great hour. We will miss uh, next Sunday, but we will be back on January, or, I'm sorry, February 18th. So yeah. see you all in a couple all right. weeks. All Thanks, right, everybody. great. You guys have a nice couple of weeks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.